This is Larry Bean speaking. We're interviewing my father, Everett Bean, uh, about his uh, war experiences, uh, or after the war, more explicitly. Uh, today is July the 17th, 2007. We're at their house in Paris, Arkansas. My mother's here with us as well. And uh, anyway, Dad, why don't you start by talking about how it was that you ended up going to the Army. Okay. The year was 1945 and I was graduating from high school and uh, Army come along drafting people 18 years of age and that happened to catch me. And uh, getting ready to go to the Army had you always got to have a basic training period. We lived in, went to school in Rockwell, North Carolina, graduated there, high school. Then uh, immediately went to Camp Blandin, Florida for basic training into the Army. 1945, when the war started, when we were in it, I also had an older brother, a paratrooper, he was in the war too. Anyway, we went to Camp Blanding, Florida. That's where they took us for training. Now, the, I first saw the camp itself. I didn't, it didn't look right because it didn't, we didn't have the big tall barracks like uh, you see in most places, most camps. We had little, I called them huts. <laughs> it was about, had a little foundation on it and about four feet high, boarded up all around. Then from that, I had screen wire on up to the top and around and had four or five beds in each hut. Had them things all lined up and they were everywhere. That was a place where we slept. Then in the morning time, when things got to going rough, we to get out the train, we started training the next day. There wasn't no waiting around about it. The war was going on. And uh, What was the date when you got to Camp Blanding? You uh, remember close to it? 19 and... Uh, 45, but what was the... Do you remember the month? Uh, it's on there somewhere. All right, well you keep talking. Go ahead. And, you went uh, straight to training. Basic training. And uh, was put in the infantry. Wasn't lucky enough to get something easy. We had to go the infantry route. And we had to fall out for Reveille every morning about seven o'clock, six or seven o'clock. And uh, about six, really. Then uh, after Reveille, they did get all the soldiers together and. They take account, see if everybody's present. And those that are not present, he wants to know where they are. And they better not be in the bed, because they, they'd be put in prison if they were. And they take no if and ends about it. Then uh, we'd get breakfast and all set, ready to go on out in the bivouac fields. We had rubber, not rubber, but boots, leather boots we wore, uniform, and uh, the uniform black art soldier boys wear. Maybe the same kind they wear today, I don't know, but anyway, we'd march out about 16, 18, 20 miles somewhere, sometimes we'd walk beside of a creek. I have boys coming back, be so hot all day and your feet so hot, walking close to the creek branks, and it was shallow, you could see where there was gravel in the bottom. When the old <laughs> captain wasn't looking, we'd slip over there and walk in the creek a little bit, cool our feet off, and then jump back in line, and never miss a lick. And he never did catch up with us about that. And that tickled us because we messed up our shoes and all, but our feet got cool. Then this basic training lasted 17 weeks. 
I mean walk, 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 walk. And this basic training thing in Camp Blind in Florida, marching and walking was about all I thought they ever learned or knew. I mean you'd walk, 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 walk and keep on walking. And uh, then when you get to where you're going, you'd be training all day, learning how to fire guns, rifles, pistols, the whole works. And uh, you would learn how to do all these things. You would lecture ship. Had big places a long way out from camp. Soldiers would stand up, sit in, in a stack of uh, lectures, uh, place was fixed for lectures, and put a whole company in, in with like stair steps, you know, and uh, sit there and listen to some captain talk and talk and talk and talk and keep on talking. And by the way, one day we were in one of these things, and all of a sudden, the captain took his pistol out of his holster and he pulled out and fired. It looked like he shot the man on the front row who was sitting on the ground in front. It looked like he shot him because we were up in the stand where we couldn't see. And then after he shot, he stepped back and he said, I'm sorry I hadn't told the rest of us. I said, I'm sorry I had to do that. I told that boy sitting there on the ground, said, look over there beside him. And about a foot from the boy was a poison snake. And he pulled that pistol out and he killed that snake right beside of that soldier. That's how good a aim he had and all. And he didn't, he didn't have time to sight. He just, to me, he didn't. He killed that snake and then it scared the rest of us. <laughs> we thought there might be snakes everywhere. Everybody started looking around. But we keep on walking out, marching on us somewhere else, stop and do this, do that, get on the firing range, you know, you had to learn to use these 45 pistols that they had, or you had to learn the M1 rifle. That was the main one, that M1 rifle. And you carry that thing with you or wherever you went except the bed. Some of them might have carried them to bed, I don't know. But, uh, get out there in the field and they'd be march all day long sometimes. You'd be so wet with sweat you couldn't stand it. Hot and right in the summertime in Florida. And I mean you'd be soaking wet. And then when time come they'd always take us back in time for the eat the meal at the base camp instead of out in the field somewhere. Until later in bivouac then we had to eat in the field. And uh, it was one big mess, really. But then when you'd be wet with sweat all over and you'd have to come back, and everybody would hunt the showers, you know, and big shower room and the showers around the walls. And uh, them boys would run and jump in the shower and some of them had to wait because they didn't have enough showers take the shower and get ready and supper will go through the chow line about six o'clock or seven, whatever it was. I don't remember now. And, uh... Rainwater. What? Rainwater. <laughs> yeah, and get in there, they had in the chow, you march around and get the tray. You go down, they put in whatever you want from whatever they have to eat. And usually, believe it or not, they had pretty good eats for an army base camp, you know. Some of them didn't like it. Some of them wouldn't like it. anything. They were too lazy to do anything. But uh, the food part didn't... I picked up a little weight myself on the food part. I didn't gripe, complain, and grumble about that. And we were all out there one day coming in from work, we call it work, it's drilling out in the field in hot weather. 
came in one day and first thing the old captain said, you boys get down to the barber shop and get a haircut. And I mean it, I mean now. So uh, we looked at him like he was crazy and boys began to scatter. And Scott went down to the barber shop and they had four or five barbers in there. He got us a haircut, come back. And they let us eat supper, you know. You march through it, and you put stuff on your tray, whatever you wanted. If you didn't want it, you didn't have to take it. But then they wanted you to eat all of it if you did take it. So that sort of clinched that. That's the way we had we in, in, in camp and in the lunchtime. You had a and you carry your plate with you and all in the pack, you know, on your back. Take your metal trays out. Then you had to cook cook out on the, they had places fixed where you could cook or heat up food and out even in the fields. And then you'd go by and they'd dip your food out the kitchen. The cooks, they had to take care of all that stuff. And oh, one day we came with out and came back in, and the uh, old captain looked at one boy and he said, "You go down to the barber shop and you get your hair cut, and I mean cut now." And he had made the boy mad, but what could he do? He had to go to the barber shop, get it cut. Well, what he it made him mad, but he. I don't know what you call the haircut, but he didn't do it like the captain was going to want it done, like just close. But if we cut a streak in it down through the middle, <laughs> he come back and the captain saw him, you know, and that thing looked like a skunk or something, other, you know. Made no captain mad, he pointed his finger at him and said, you get back down there and you cut all of that hair off now, I mean now. You'll wish you'd never seen Camp Blend. So he, my old boy got mad. He didn't want to go. He said, you're going, you're going now. If I have to take you down now. So he made him back, had to cut it all off then. To, so he wouldn't look like an idiot. <laughs> or maybe he did look like one. Mm -hmm. But we had 17 weeks of that stuff. We had the firing range. You walked up to a firing range and there was a place where they had a pistol if you're on the pistol range. Or to take that M1 rifle you had. And uh, he gave you the orders and you had the equipment and the ammunition and everything ready to fire. You take that old rifle and put it up and uh, wrap that belt around you somewhere or another. You, you had to do it, keep it steady and uh, start firing. They'll tell you when to start, they'll tell you when to stop firing. I know one day on a 500 yard targets, and I said, we'll never be able to hit those targets 500 yards away. And firing away, you know, and happened to hit, pull the trigger, and they put up a flag out there. I'd hit the, the target at 500 yards away. I tried hard to hit some more, but I don't know whether I ever hit another one or not. But uh, most of them never did hit a 500 flag away. But up short, you could do real good, you know. They were happy that we could uh, handle a rifle and handle a pistol like that, you know. And they got on and on for 17 weeks that way. And uh, you lived and uh, you digested <laughs> army life, you know. And uh, you hear a lot about girls and boys. There was no such thing as girls around there. It was an army camp. And uh, we uh, got, when we was finally getting through, was 17 weeks. I remember the old captain was playing golf one day and me and another boy was in the kitchen pulling KP and they said that man kept peeling or keep peeling but uh, we were in the 
we got out of the kitchen, the captain come in there and he wanted two people to carry golf for him and somebody else on some kind of a day and they could go out and play golf. So we had, we were on KP and we had to get out and then go out to the fields. But uh, we said, we'll go. We went out there with them and that's the biggest mistake we ever made. Had them old army bags loaded with clubs and all. They didn't have little cars like you ride along in now. <clears throat> you had to carry those bags. You had to be there to get him a different club or whatever he wanted, a different one. And all this crap. And I tell you what, that boy and myself, the next time we were on, still on KP, he come in there the next day we saw him coming, we climbed in behind the stove so he couldn't find us. <laughs> and uh, we hid back there and wouldn't say nothing. He, he said, uh, asked the cook, said, where are these boys that were here yesterday? And he, he knew where we were, but he, he told them, he said, I don't know where they are. He said, why? He said, you want to use them? He said, yeah, I sure do. But he said, I got I to gotta go play golf and to get somebody else. Boy, it tickled us. We didn't get to go that time. We didn't have to go that time. What was your rating on the M1? Uh, I don't know. All of them, as, a, as an average out, about three, I guess. That means three out of each. Uh, you get hit the bull out three times out of four. That, something like that. Uh, maybe I have hit it five out of five. But uh, then when the time of summer was about over, we had the war still going over in Germany. So we're getting ready to go to war. And it uh, seemed like we did let, he let us go home for a weekend or something to be back at a certain place, get on the ship and go to uh, overseas, over in combat in Germany. Nuremberg, Germany, and uh, got on this, got back, got on that ship. Well, that was a rough ride, I want you to know. Now, was the war still going when you got on the ship? Yes, um, the war had just ended when we got on the ship, I think. I think so it was. They had been fighting and fighting and fighting all the time, and we got word, uh, and it's pretty close in that range, that uh, they had signed up for everybody and everything, and they'd give up or somebody give up on them. And the war was over, they said, you know. But the cleanup it just begins. They said, don't think you boys are going to get out of anything. You're not going home, that's for sure. You're going right to the battlefields just like everybody else. And. Uh, we got over there we, 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 on the ship or something else. So I had a, there was a lieutenant that was in charge of the guards on the ship. He had to have guards in wartime, and they had the guards on the ship and 24 guards on that ship. That's all soldiers.